Okay, here we are again for part two of Bubsy Pause and Fire. Um, now I've changed my setup a little bit since last week. Um, this is the audio coming out of the TV speakers. Um, I've been down there, so it's coming out. If, if, if the stream audio, if like, my microphone is picking it up. Because that's bad for everybody. I'll be able to hear the game more better than I was with that weird headphone set up last week. Turn that down and turn myself up. Yeah, I forgot that would be an issue, strangely. I'm so dumb, I? Okay, so I've turned my TV up. Again, uh, this is Bubsy Pause on Fire. I'm back for round two to finish off the game. So I couldn't get through the whole thing last week. Um, let me know if the audio is coming through this, the microphone because I'm worried about echoing and stuff. Uh, so if you can hear double the game audio or anything like that, let me know. Um, yes. Okay, good. <laughs> Gibbon says that's much better. Good. Yeah, sorry about that. Alright, to start off with, let's watch the opening movie again. Just because we can. And it will remind us of the plot. And I might be able to comment on it more this time. Because like I said, this is following up a lot of Bubsy 2 stuff. Um, so here's Terry and Terry, the nibblings. Bubsy claiming that they're not actually related. Bubsy being obsessed with um, TV fame and screen stardom. Regular children's gymnasium is the sign there. And if you look on the wall, actually next to them there's some graffiti that says Oblivia was here or something? Yeah, Oblivia was here. So that's a reference to one of the characters from the animated series pilot who never made it into the games. I did a bit of research actually and I was operating under a slight misconception. I thought the series, that, that the cartoon came a bit later than um, some of the games. Uh, yeah, that's right. A, an Oblivia reference, that's really cool. Um, but yeah, what I found out was that the uh, the animated series pilot, which never went to the series, um, seemingly was created before Bubsy 2, and so all the elements in Bubsy 2 that are taken from the cartoon, such as Arnold, Terry and Terry, uh, Virgil Reality, they were all made for the show and then reused in the games. So the games did, did not take on other elements from the pilot, such as the antagonist Ali Cat. Uh, Oblivia, of course, who was also a cat. Um, and I guess, yeah, was one of the good guys. And Buzz and Sid, the vultures, didn't uh, never made it into an actual game. And yeah, I've talked over the whole intro as well. But the gist is that the Woolies have made an alliance with Bubsy to stop Oinka P. Ham, who is one of the original creations for Bubsy 2, not taken from the pilot. Um, and he's trying to put together a galactic zoo, much in the same way as Metalbeard. Metalbeard? Razorbeard. <laughs> Metalbeard's from the Lego movie. Razorbeard is from Rayman 2, and the early versions of the plot of Rayman 2, which, again, informed that shows, the, that animated series, the Rayman animated series. Um, yeah, versions of that plot involved you know, uh, Razorbeard creating a zoo and kidnapping all sorts of strange creatures for it. I'm not sure what his motivations for kidnapping everyone was in the final product. Slavery? Or something? I don't know. Anyway, um, yeah, it's interesting how some things came from the pilot, some didn't, and a lot of it's getting referenced here, so it's nice. So, to cover what's happening in chat, ah, Tonya's here too. Welcome, welcome. Very good to see you. And Gibbon as well. And yeah, what a difference a week makes. From what I hear, a lot more of the United States is under self-isolation right now. Uh, for Tonya, it's day nine. 
and Tonya com complimenting the animation in the cutscenes. Um, yeah, given the Rayman animated series was something else. It was really interesting. They completely threw out much of the game lore and made up a new cast, but it kind of worked at least until later episodes where it turned into weird sitcom tropes with the detective guy. That was a bit odd, but I like I liked the world that they built in that and how it was similar but distinct from the game's lore. Anyway, let's do this game, shall we? Um, oh, what was I going to say? Oh yeah, so Tonya said that the um, cutscenes are well animated. I've got, I've actually done a bit more research this time. I came, kind of went into the game quite abruptly last time. So I, I do have some information about the developers of the game and other stuff that they worked on, which is something I always like to do. And I'll discuss that a bit as we go on, but let's play a level first. I've got enough talking up, fr up front. Let's do some gameplay. So we should be entering a new area. Yes, here we go. Oops. Yeah, I was supposed to. There we go. Um, yeah, so now we're in the zoo, the Amazutorium, which is a play on... Oh, okay, if you run into the side of a popcorn box, it will kill you. Yeah, it's in a play on the Amazutorium from Bubsy 2. So Oinka, P Oinka P. Ham has... Whoops. I thought that would be slightly high enough, but I guess not. Naped Crusader. Missed it. I need those Arnold tokens. I need them. Um, the vibration is that the controller is actually distracting me. So, yeah, I don't know if Oinker is creating um, hybrids or if these hybrids exist somewhere. I sh really should have been watching that opening cutscene more closely, huh? <laughs> anyway, we see there are two can draw. Oh, wow. This is a little bit more described. Something I kind of talked about last time, how levels vary between, or, or when it's easier you can sort of do whatever and get through, but I guess as the game continues it gets more into a runner, a traditional um, Gaijin games, choice provisions, runner style uh, runner game, where it's like your actions are very what am I saying um, like the actions that you're required to do to get through a level are very precise and um, predetermined if you, if you see what I mean and that's part of how those games are, are kind of synced to the music in a way now I can't actually hear the game audio very well at all so I'm going to turn it off on my end hopefully it in but I want to get more of a sense of that because I don't feel it was a fair assessment last week with the audio glitches that I was having. In the running games, it's very much whenever you interact with anything, pick up a little gold collectible or hit an enemy or something, or hit an obstacle. Um, it would make a, a particular sound which was sort of mixed into the music in a way. So I wouldn't, I don't know if I would call it exactly a rhythm platformer, but there's, there was a lot more element of music being incorporated into the game actions, I think. I should have used the intervening week um, to play <laughs> runner games because I have at least one of them, but I didn't. Instead I did watch some segments of long plays just before starting this. Oh, hello! You on Melee? Oh, okay. It's my spouse. Say hello, I'm streaming. 
<laughs> Say hello to Ben now, she's behaving. Hello! Hello, cat. <laughs> she only tried to eat my uh, microphone cable a little bit. And now she's just chilling out on my lap. Very cute. So there we go, that's one level down of the zoo world. Hey, Bobinate is here. Welcome. Very good to see you, Bob. Um, oh, Bobinate is asking, so this game doesn't even bother with the rhythm game aspect, does it? Yeah, that's kind of what I was just talking about, coincidentally. Um, no, it doesn't. <laughs> and that's unfortunate. Um, for what is essentially another installment of the Runner series, because it, it pretty much is. <laughs> Well, it's hard to look at chat when I'm playing a game that is so demanding of my visual attention. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> um, Gibbon says he's got... He commends me for resisting the urge to reset after missing a yarn ball. Yeah. I, I would be here all day. My goal today is to get through the game. Um, I, I'm not going to commit to going back later and playing it myself on my own time, but um, yeah, depending on the game, I do sometimes do that, but I'm not going to do it for this game. Let me see. But yeah, in, in terms of this being a runner installment, um, okay, I'm going to put my chat a bit closer and maybe I'll have more chance of seeing it. I do get the notification pop-ups when there's a new chat message since I'm streaming from the PS4, so that's convenient. But, um, yeah, I can't always look down. Sorry. <laughs> Parking cost 80,000 atoms? Highway robbery! Wow, that is expensive parking. Oops. Yeah, so about this being a runner installment, um, I was reflecting on it because I went back and checked the Kickstarter that I mentioned last week. So while the game was in development and almost finished, um, Choice Provisions created a Kickstarter to fund further expansions on the game. Um, and, oops. Yeah, I, I want to at least get the Arnold ones because that gives me another chance to get another token, which is progress. Um, yeah, so they made a Kickstarter. Uh, which is, it's kind of odd to make a Kickstarter for a game that is already, you know, the game itself is funded by the publisher or the, the rights holder or whatever, I assume. <laughs> um, but they were kickstarting and like expansions on the game. And so I have the information about that now. Oh, where to start with that, where to start. Oops. This is a lot harder than I expected. But the difficulty has been slowly ramping up over the course of the game, hasn't it? Come on. Alright, I won't try for every atom. Maybe I can pop over that soul blade. Yeah, cool. See ya. Have a good day. Ah, nuts. So yeah, so the Kickstarter, um, it was titled Spicy Extras. Oh, Budsy Pours on Fire, Spicy Extras. And had a funding goal of 40,000 Australian dollars. It didn't make it. It got to about 30,000 from 444 backers. Um, the extra features that they stated would be put into the game as a result of this extra funding were um, new costumes, more sound bites from Bubsy, um, a digital OST. Yay, I got the thing. I just have to not die. Oh, God. Um, yeah, Digital OST, a new playable character, which was 
heavily implied to be Commander video from the Runner series. Um, a new quote unquote impossible world of seven levels with a boss fight as well. Um, and one other thing, a physical PS4 edition. Oh, if I pop up too quickly, I die. Interesting. Um, whoa. Bob says, I really wish I knew how these games were made. Does that Chinese publishing company just go around offering money for people to make a Bubsy game? Did a, did a developer actually say, hey, please let us make a Bubsy game. This is our live stream. Um, if I was to guess, I would say the former. Um, yeah. Tomo wanting to make Bubsy a thing. I'm just shopping it around. It's pretty interesting how the developer they chose in both cases kind of informed what the game was. And it ended up being pretty similar to something else they'd already made. Um, Tonya says, oh boy. The fact, yeah, Tonya says, I feel that the fact that it wasn't necessary is what killed the Kickstarter. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, so I'm, I mentioned all the content that they wanted to add to the game, but like I said, the, they admit in the, in the Kickstarter pitch that they're already working on the game. Um, it's nearly finished. So why are they asking for funding exactly? And it's got to be behind the scenes reason to do with the publisher, right? Like the publisher didn't give them enough money, possibly, um, to make the game they wanted to make. And they crowdsourced some more money to make it a better final product, which they didn't get. And so implicitly then the final product is not what the developers intended and it's lesser than what they intended, you know? Ah. Um, yeah, but all, all that extra content I mentioned, there was 100% uh, no guarantee that it was all going to be in the game because it was all tied to different stretch goals as well. So the initial goal was just for some costumes and new sound files. And all those other things I mentioned just went up from there until it got to hundreds of thousands of uh, American dollars. The initial one was 25 US, I think. Um, 25,000. Uh, nuts. So, yeah, even the Commander Video stretch goal was 75,000 US dollars. And clearly they didn't get anywhere near that. You don't, I mean, you don't really know how your Kickstarter is going to do before it starts, right? That's kind of the point. <laughs> um, you just hope it'll do well. But, yeah. That's, that's one thing I feel that having Commander Video in there really would have cemented it as uh, a more legitimate installment in the series, even if, you know, some of the gameplay uh, elements with, with the music syncing concepts is not really there in this product. Why is this... Why is this throwing me off so much? Concentrate a bit. Yeah. Ah. Okay. I'm gonna hold the button. Yeah, so it's unclear to me how much of it would have been included in the game if they'd made that funding, because a lot of it has an asterisk below it saying this may be included as premium DLC in the final game. So they didn't even have, like, a clear concept of um, what was being funded here. Is it just going to be stuff in the game or is it going to be sold later? And I don't think I got a straight answer as a backer on whether the content they were including would be guaranteed me if it was decided to sell it as the premium DLC. Um, the reason I backed it, which I did, was to get a slightly cheaper copy of the game when it launched, um, which was the main idea, I guess. Oh boy.
but yeah, I agree with Tonya. The fact that it didn't feel like... Because <laughs> you're not backing a game, you're backing expansions to the game, which hasn't even come out yet. And the developer has cred, but you don't know if the product they're going to de deliver is going to be up to the same caliber as their runner games. And I think what we've decided is that it really isn't, unfortunately. Um, Bob says, why would you make a Bubsy game in 2018? Uh, I think the game eventually was released in 2019, but yes, I see your point. And play it entirely straight. What are the regulations on this whole thing? What's stopping you from making just from just making one big irony fest? Hmm. I would say that there are elements of irony to both of the rebooted Bubsy, not rebooted, but um, you know, recent um, Bubsy installments to do with the, the voice lines and things like that. The plot is is played pretty straight, I guess, but. They really are leaning on Bubsy being a wisecracking protagonist to inject that element of uh, meta humor to it. But is that enough? Do you do you want more than more than that? Is what I'm asking. Oops. I've got to hold down the jump button when I bounce off, but not press it too early because then I'll just do a quick double double pop. Oh, of course, you get a triple jump if you're bopping off an enemy. Crazy. Um, yeah, Tonya says, 40,000 just for costumes? So weird. How bizarre. Yeah, the 40,000 was just... Ah! The 40,000 Australian dollars was just for two new costumes and some new voice lines for Bubsy, which was the one uh, feature note that wasn't um, possibly going to be paid DLC. Okay, hop, 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 ah, don't even hop. Okay. Oh, dang it. Okay. This is just insane. Forget it, forget all the items, just get through. Just get the Arnold thing. Cool. I'm gonna hop over this crab. Nope. Okay, I can just do that. Yeah, avoid the whole thing. Safety first. Mm. And that is actually a really good point, given I would agree with that um, argument there. Given saying that he's glad they didn't have too much irony in it, because he doesn't like the very self aware. Haha, ha, look at our bad game social media account. Um, yeah, because when Tommy bought the IP and they revived the quote unquote accolade brand, and. Dang it. Um, and they took control of the, yeah, the IP, they made the social media account, and it was all very self aware of, oh, Bubsy has this terrible reputation, so we're gonna lean into that. Um, which hasn't really come across into the new games so much. Um, Bubsy himself has an obnoxious attitude that's, that exists in the new games. Oh, I forgot. This is too hard to do. <laughs> um, <laughs> and Tonya says that she's already annoyed and the game is too ironic as it is. <laughs> um, and given on the topic of Bubsy's characterization, saying that Bubsy is too flanderized in these two new uh, games that have come out recently. Like he wasn't an oblivious idiot in the originals. I wonder about that. Oblivious idiot. I think I need to review the cartoon pilot in the comics that I'm in. But even in the like voice quips that existed in the games, he was kind of self-obsessed. Not to a cartoonish degree though, I guess is what you're saying. You better hope you've got your will ring, boinker. 
Maybe I'm mischaracterizing. Mm. Tanya saying they're a fan of, not a fan of anything but Spanky the Bobcat. That's an exaggeration, but geez, I love it when these games are genuine, but the voice clips really do just make me lose it. <laughs> Shut up, Virgil. <laughs> yeah. The excessive voice clips is definitely something that they're leaning into, isn't it? Wooly Strike Back even had a slider in the menu where you could change Bubsy's verbosity so that he would quip more or less often, which is a self-aware choice on the, on the game's part, definitely. Okay, we can't kill a crab. Whoops. Um, Gibbon says yes, but he was still aware of what was going on. In the opening scene of this, he's going on about how the Woolies agent managed to get on TV while everyone else is freaking, uh, managed to get the Woolies on TV while everyone else is freaking out about the evil plot going on. Yes, I see what you mean, and that would qualify as characterization, wouldn't it? So are all these animals hybrids? We've got a crab that's in a box with a beach ball. That doesn't necessarily mean that the crab itself is a half beach ball, half crab, does it? These flies look a bit like a mosquito from Rainham. Given continuing his argument, um, Bubsy seems to be the same sort as early Johnny Cage, thinking he's in a production and not realizing this is all real. Like, yes, there was that fourth wall breaking in the originals, but it was in the same vein as Cranky Kong, not Bubsy literally being an idiot and thinking this was all stage effects. Yeah, this is a good point. <laughs> And Tonya's been watching the black and white arc of the Pokemon anime. The voice clips here remind them of why sometimes cartoon voices can be grating. Ah, yes. I... yeah. It's something about voice actor speak that is sometimes... Yeah, grating, like you say. It's unfortunate. And it's a personal thing. And, and then in anime you get an additional layer of weirdness where, depending on the translation, it can be kind of strangely phrased or something. I call it translation ease when something is, it's too obvious that it's come from a foreign language, like an idioms have been translated too closely and stuff like that. Yeah, it's weird. After four kids lost the dub. They have just the same three people doing the Pokemon voices. <laughs> yeah, Pokemon having voices was always a weird thing about the anime, wasn't it? All right, Arnold. Yeah, so you might not be able to hear this, but again, the sound effects in the Arnold levels are coming out of my controller of coming out of the TV, which is an odd gimmick, and I'm not really sure what it adds to <laughs> the experience. Except for the fact that it's a weird novelty, because games don't often do it. And it's confusing my cat. Hello, cat. Sorry about Arnold, of course. So Tonya thinks that the Pokemon voices have gone downhill since four kids lost the dub. Given says it's frustrating because at the same uh, 
At the same time, the devs of this game have obviously poured over Bubsy history and have referenced pretty much every official thing out of the series up to this point in this title. Well, personally, my personal favourite instalment is Fractured Fairy Tales on Jaguar, and nothing else ever references that. It's really the black sheep of the series, so... Um, that annoys me that that never gets referenced. <laughs> and I wish they would. <laughs> wow, Bubsy really does have a very different jump arc to Virgil. Oh wow. There was a cage up there, closed for cleanup, and there was a big poo in it. Also, I'm seeing this toucan giraffe again and again. And I'm trying to keep an eye out for any other animals that could be. There's a stall that says, not churros. Of course, the original Bubsy game had a theme park world, right? As did Mr. Nuts. A... Um, not linked at all. And yet, I would call it a sister series <laughs> to Bubsy. Mm. If only because of famine. Oops. What? They made Team Rocket into serious characters? What's up with that? I'm glad I stopped watching the Pokemon anime 20 years ago. <laughs> Yeah, I haven't kept up with it, but I went and at some point they had the Genesect movie on TV and I watched that. That's like, okay, I've missed 10 movies, but let's let's check this one out. I heard it's got a Mewtwo in it. And yeah, it was it was really boring and stupid. <laughs> mm. But I hear the movies vary in quality a lot. I didn't quite get what I was supposed to do there. You're supposed to be able to pounce through the different enemies, I guess. Maybe you can pounce after hitting an enemy while pouncing. That's possible. That's a cool thing. Where hitting an enemy can renew your actions. Oh, okay. Team Rocket goes serious only in the black and white. Arc, I guess. And it's really bad, apparently. <laughs> oh. This is pretty demanding, actually. But hey, it's not so demanding if you're not going for all yarn balls, so... <laughs> Let's just be a little bit more lax, shall we? Curses! What did I just say? Um, yes, so did I finish talking about the Kickstarter? I think it was odd. I don't know much about game development and budgets, but yeah, the fact that the stretch goals were ended up being a lot and yeah, I don't know what the cost value analysis really is, but was interesting, wasn't it? I guess the pledge tiers... I did mention that, didn't I? Um, if you pledge at higher tiers, you get other Bubsy games that had been made, as well as the Tufa pack on Steam. Um, and some of the higher tiers even included copies of the earlier runner games that Choice Provisions had made. Which to me is more sort of legitimacy of naming this as part of that great series. You know. That's how I think of it anyway. Whereas I wouldn't think of Woolly Strike Back as, uh, as much of um, part of the Gianna Sisters series.
maybe because they made it a bit more unique, the gameplay and stuff. Oops. Hmm. Yeah, I don't really know. But yeah, we're seeing that same giraffe toucan again and again, aren't we? Let's see what's on the map screen. There's the Toucan Giraffe, and there's maybe a Lion Rhinoceros, maybe? Can't tell what the head is supposed to be. A dog, perhaps? It's got floppy ears, like a big muzzle. Hmm. Let me see. Tonya says there was an arc where Team Rocket and Plasma were going to be fighting over a MacGuffin that could control Pokemon. And they were building up to it, but the Japanese earthquake of 2011 really messed up the schedule, and Team Plasma didn't show up for 100 episodes after that. So they cancelled the big two-parter where Team Rocket was fighting Team Plasma. Wow. Um, and the black and white anime went through a ridiculous amount of filler as well. Yeah, this sounds bad. Why are you watching this? <laughs> Um, and Given says that he wishes that they had, would put Bubsy 3D and Fractured Fairy Tales on Steam. Yeah, me too. They're conspicuous in their absence, aren't they? But I would say that, one, those games aren't as well known, so they would get less return on it, and two, it's much harder to, to do that technically, because with the two SNES games, they literally just had a SNES emulator and some ROMs, and that's what they put on Steam. Whereas, oops, <laughs> whereas it, it would be more of a challenge to do that for PlayStation and Jaguar games. So they just don't want to invest in it, I guess. But yeah, it would be good. I would also say, uh, I mean, you've watched you've watched me stream the whole Bubsy series, I would like them to also put the Game Boy version of Bubsy 2 on, and also the Mega Drive version as an option. But that's how I feel about game preservation generally, whenever they re-release old games. The recent um, Aladdin and Lion King collection thing did it pretty well, where different versions of the games were available, it, you know, the ones that they owned, the virgin ones, not the ones that were made by other companies, but where there were different like ports, um, they included all of them, almost all of them. They didn't actually include all of them, to, to be fair, <laughs> to be unfair. Um, like they had the Game Boy version, but not the Game Boy Color version, I believe, something like that. Um, so even that wasn't a perfect collection. And also, I'm sure most people didn't play, uh, you know, 70% of the versions on that because they're still downgraded ports or something like that. Um, but it's nice that they were there. <laughs> uh, oop. Yeah, and um, so it would be nice to get a Bubsy Classics collection that had everything. That would be amazing. I would buy that. As long as it included scans of the manual comics and a viewable uh, movie file for the animated series pilot. <laughs> that really would be everything, I think, except for the fan games, of course, which in some ways have had a large impact on fandom. Particularly Arcane Kids' uh, James Terrell retrospective game. That's just amazing. Oh! Tonya says that they're now up to the N arc, which is okay-ish. Alright then, that's good. Glad you're enjoying that. Uh, I hit my timing gets slightly off, and then bang. But it's done, but Colrus is evil when that's done. Yeah, I played White 2, or Black 2, no it was White 2. Colrus was in that. Um, I don't really know what they were doing. As far as I could tell, they were morally ambiguous or something. I don't know. 
Oh, they showed up in Sun and Moon, didn't they? On one route and just did nothing, right? They're just there. Yeah, it's weird. And Chorus has one of the dumbest hairdos in the whole Pokemon franchise. Whoops. Which is really saying something. Let me think, who else has really dumb hair, dude? Um, N has green hair, what's up with that? Yeah, baby. Nailed that part. Yes, I knew that would happen. And an Arnold token right before a checkpoint, so if you miss it, you gotta replay the whole level. How about that? Fantastic. Yeah, so dumbest Pokemon here, go. Opinions, please. Wait a minute. How are these bluefish surviving outside the water? Bluefish have gills. They need to extract oxygen from water. They can't just breathe. Oops. Yeah, I missed it again. I'm not going for all atoms. Yeah. This is a really different experience when you can hear all the sound effects. Remember last week how I said nothing was making noises except picking up tokens? This is much nicer. I like it. Oops. Yeah, I shouldn't, I shouldn't go for that. Um, no, I did not play Ultra, Sun and Moon. I only played Base Moon, which is the better version from what I hear anyway, because they really mess with the plot in stupid ways in Ultra. Oops. During the Rainbow Rocket nonsense, they show up and just teleport gets us to another dimension. Tonya says they're not a fan of Lysander, Team Flare's boss, bloody psychopath. Yeah, but who has the worst hair? Come on. Opinions, people. Who has the worst hair in Pokemon? Oh no, I missed that! No! What does this button do? Does it go back to checkpoint or does it restart a level? Uh, I can't, I can't. I really hate it. Yeah, on that screen it's replay level, but I don't know about the... It's probably replay level. Oh, okay. <laughs> Tonya clarifying that, yes, Lysander's hair is what they meant. Have you seen his hair? You know what? I can't bring it to mind. I didn't play X and Y, so... I, I don't know what Lysander's it's hair looks like off the top of my head. Let me look so it up. Okay. Lysander. Oh boy. Yeah, that's really dumb. He looks like a lion man. Okay, that's pretty dumb, I'll give you that. Um, let me see. Gibbon says that he's now on the lookout for Fractured Fairy Tales references. <laughs> Please do, yes. <laughs> and he says, I don't feel like anyone has ever given me an actual answer about how the story was changed other than just telling me it was bad. Okay, well, first of all, the Team Rainbow Rocket thing is silly. They bring Giovanni in as a dimension hopping uh, super villain mastermind who is somehow able to recruit 
villains from alternate timelines where they won and achieved their aims in the Pokemon games. And then somehow he convinces them all to come together and then come to uh, Alola and take over the, the whatever future foundation that Lusa means in charge of. And that's just really stupid on the face of it, but also they use designs of the characters. Whoops. So I know, for example, instead of using the updated designs of Archie and Maxi from... What? Why was I not able to move back fast enough? Like, the screen is scrolling faster. Oh, what? Why was I going slower? Oh, you move slow when you're shooting. Ah, clever. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, so instead of using the updated designs of Archie and Maxi from Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, they use the original versions from the Game Boy Advance games. Um, that's just a, a minor thing. That's not really a big criticism, I think. Um, whoops. So, so that's really dumb. Um, they add this whole thing where there's people living in the Ultra Dimension and they're like superheroes, uh, they're like a Power Rangers team or something, and that's pretty dumb too. But I think the main criticism that I've heard about the story is that they changed Lusamine's character, whereas in the original she was a really interesting, like, abusive parent, and there was this whole thing with um, her daughter Lily. Lily? Is it Lily? I think it's Lily. Like trying to be her own person and break out from her mother's influence, they kind of change it to make Lusamine more sympathetic, and her lackey is the main villain, apparently. And that's really both, you know, it, it's misguided and it kind of wrecks what was interesting about the original story. So there you go, there's some answers based on what I've heard. Gibbon says, yes, he knows about the Rainbow Rocket stuff, but the main storyline changes. Yes, so I did give some examples there and Gibbon agrees that sounds kind of bad. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So as Tonya says, most of it is the same through the first three islands or whatever. But then... Um... It suddenly becomes, there's an altered dimension where you've got to go and end the darkness. Okay, so I didn't know all the details of that part, but that sounds very dumb, actually. Wow, so there's some pretty high token requirements for these levels. Oh man, these are all four. I gotta get four more for each one. Oh, that's really, yeah, so I gotta basically clear each level up to that point. So what I can do at this point is go back to earlier levels, I think. To get some quick tokens, I'm going to do a bit of a tour of previous worlds, I guess. I didn't think this would take so long today, but look, we're already 45 minutes in and I'm only, I've only done two levels and haven't unlocked the third. That's actually pretty frustrating. Hey, maybe this will be a three-parter. Lol. Okay. Oh, right. Sorry, I'm looking at the wrong part of the screen. So, yeah, let's go back and do some earlier levels and get some tokens. Ooh! Thank you so much, Gibbon. Gibbon has found a Fractured Fairy Tales reference. Popping balloons. Were they in the original Bobsy? Because they're in Fractured Fairy Tales. And... Mm, I'm banking in here. Problem is that, now that you say that, I can't actually give you an answer. Were there balloons in the original Bubsy that you pop? Thinking, thinking. If I say no and I'm wrong, I'm gonna seem like a bad fan, which I am to be fair. If I say I don't remember, that's also a bad look. But if I say yes there were, I'll be lying because I don't know. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Gibbon says he'll try and check. 
Oh, what, okay. Lucamine is working with the Power Ranger team to save their universe. Yeah, this is really dumb. Oops. And the only additions in terms of, I would say, uh, not content, but like, Pokemon, uh, I guess, is I know that they added a couple of extra Ultra Beasts, and the Ultra Beasts were almost my least favorite part of Alola anyway. So my recommendation is, if you want to play a Gen 7 game, stick with the original Sun and Moon. They're quite good. I like the new structure where the gym challenges, quote unquote, have different kinds of things going on. You have more interaction with the characters, the gym leaders. What I just noticed is that when you get the atoms, there are little noises that kind of blend in with the music. So it sort of has that going on from Runner. There's less of a feeling that your actions are timed and synced with the rhythm of the music, though. Which is unfortunate. Oh no, Gibbon only has Ultra Moon, sorry. <laughs> Tanya says, Sword and Shield is great, but the story is even more poorly thought out. Haha. <laughs> um, yeah, Gibbon was unemployed and broke right as Sun and Moon came out and missed the window to play alongside everyone. By the time I had disposable income, again, Ultras were out. It do be like that sometimes, indeed it do. Oh, that's, that's too bad, I'm sorry about that. Gibbon says he lost steam on Ultra Moon because everyone kept telling him how bad it was without explaining. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sad now. Hmm. I guess if you hadn't played the originals and you just did Ultra Moon, maybe you wouldn't have been able to tell that they'd made negative changes to the story. Maybe you would have had a good time anyway. Oh. That's too bad, because I do like Alola. I wouldn't say that you've missed the window, though. You could still play it now. Oops. I play old games all the time. says that they remember in S.H.I.E.L.D. where like there's a scene where the NPCs are looking in shock and telling you oh my gosh a Pokemon Dynamax in the city and it's rampaging and you go to the next scene and the champion is there smiling and going boy you should have seen that I took care of it though yeah yeah that's like a point where you go what is the budget of this game why couldn't they show us that scene but I heard other people saying that was sort of an interesting choice because it's a bit more realistic, like you're hearing about things that are happening off screen. Um, and it makes Leon, or the intent is that it makes Leon seem cool. But it also makes it feel like you're not the most important character, you're like not the super duper chosen one or whatever, which is nice. Um, but yeah, it is odd that they couldn't even show you what was happening there. Yeah, I understand that. 
um, about missing the window to play it alongside everyone else where people are excited and it was a community. Yeah. Instead I post game progress and nobody's excited and then there's the discussion about how I got a worse version. Oh. Dang. I'm not sure what the fruits actually do for you. They don't give you gems, but they fill your bonus meter. Is this all just points? Like, all you need to do is finish the level when you get a, uh, <coughs> a token, right? And you get something extra for getting more gems, maybe? I don't even know. Have I even managed to get all of the collectibles in any level so far? For one character. Oh, here's one where I've got 150 for everybody somehow. But there's not even like a sparkly thing, no indication. Oh, the star on the level on the map is bigger. Yeah, that's what happens. Cool. Um, great. <laughs> So if you want to go for everything, that's what happens. Okay. Contrast with me posting progress on three houses a year after release and everyone's really excited for me to experience the story. Well, I would say two or three people are excited for you to experience the story. Um, I personally couldn't kill us, but that's just me. Um, Given says... <laughs> He feels like Pokemon fans are too serious about the whole thing sometimes. Ooh. Though he agrees that it sounds like the story changes in Ultra are bad. <laughs> Tony agrees Pokemon fans did overreact about Sword and Shield, though the story is bad in their opinion. Um, and that the game is rushed. That almost felt like it was into the music a little bit as I was going there. <laughs> well, I, I mentioned it earlier, but I should tell you about some of the people who worked on this game. It's a relatively small team, but it's got a lot of stuff in common with the other runner games, as you might expect. Since we're on the subject of music, um, that was done by Grant Henry, aka Stemage, who I knew from Metroid Metal, a metal band that does covers of Metroid. It's fun. I bought a, a couple of their CDs. Yes, CDs. <laughs> Not digital downloads. Um, yeah, that's that's a really fun project. Heavy metal covers of Metroid music, it fits really well. But he also did the soundtrack for Steven Universe, which from what I gather is a musical show, or at least the movie's a musical, because I heard about a recent sing-along screening of the movie that got cancelled because of uh, pandemic issues. Oh man, I missed an atom. Okay, let's do Arnold. Ooh, Gibbon confirming that there are no balloons in the theme park world of Bubsy One. So there you go, there is a Fractured Fairy Tales reference in this game. Asterisk, sort of. <laughs> That's fun. I'm happy now. Thank you for that. You made all my dreams come true, Gibbon. Speaking of which, I did promise you last week that I would play a game of your choice on stream as a birthday request, so get back to me on what you want me to play, because I have my computer back now, finally. It took them almost a whole week to get the battery replaced. 
but everything's running again. And if Gibbon doesn't if Gibbon doesn't pick something, then Tanya, you can pick something. <laughs> Yeah, Arnold levels are quicker, so I'm getting more tokens per um, time spent. So it's worth it to go back to these early levels. And the early levels are easier too. So. <laughs> okay, give me God the message I this never time. Knew I could <laughs> never knew I could double jump before. Yeah, according to uh, promotional material for this game, the, the helmet is the reason why Virgil is so nimble. Which, again, doesn't make any sense at all. But I was asking about that last week. Like, what is the helmet doing for him in this situation? But apparently it is the reason that he can double jump. Maybe... Maybe he's in virtual reality. Maybe this whole thing is a virtual reality simulation. Whoa! Maybe this whole game never happened. I do like, it's my personal theory that the events of Fractured Fairy Tales, the Jaguar game, are, whoa, sorry, cat fell off lap. Okay, she's back now. She just slid off in her sleep. Um, yeah, it's my theory that the events of Fractured Fairy Tales are a result of leftover residual plot from the second game where Virgil's imaginatorium or whatever thingy um, was able to pull things from out of time and space and project them into the amazatorium or whatever it's called. Um, so my theory was that considering that it's not just pulling from history but also seems to be drawing from folklore, mythology, literature, that sort of thing, then the sort of fractured furry tales aspect where Bubsy is traversing stories from folklore is him cleaning up after the continued um, events that happened in Bubsy 2. Does that make sense? If you think about what sort of things are represented in Bubsy 2, that was the medieval world, which is, yeah, history. That was like a space world, which I guess is the future. It could be science fiction. Uh, what else is there? Is there a Wild West world? <laughs> that was Bubsy 1. There was a kind of Wild West type thing with airships. And that was the, that was sort of the flying levels. Um, there was a justification for this theory. I'm pretty sure there was some fictional element of the world in Bubsy 2. Or it could be that it's a further um, mutation or improvement to the technology that Virgil was using that then enabled it to pull from fiction as well as reality, maybe? And make it real? Yeah, there we go. That could work. Because the final boss was like Mother Goose or something, right? That's actually... Fractured Fairy Tales. I didn't finish the whole thing on stream, to my regret. Because it was too hard and my emulator didn't do save states or something. I should have another go at that at some point. And bore everybody to death. Yeah. Let me see. Given deciding <laughs> Ruby and Sapphire. I would love to play that. The original Pokemon Pinball was basically in my Game Boy Color. Tonya says, people tell me Team Aqua and Magma are dumb, but I like them. Yeah, they're fine. They were the first of the really silly, over-the-top villain plot kind of organizations. Mm, it's not that weird, Bubsy. You're fine. Whoops. I've forgotten how Bubsy controls. Oh, 
Maybe I should revisit the zoo again soon. I'll pull clear this level and then we'll go see what progress we've made. Oh, that's right, Mother Goose was in a cage, you were rescuing her. Yeah, you never see Mother Goose come back into another Bubsy game, do you? So, let me see. Yeah, I had some other developer anecdotes here. Oops. Tonya mentioned how in the intro the animation looked cool. Well, credited animator for this game was Ryan Glovka, who worked at Monster Games during production of Donkey Kong Country Returns 3D and Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze. Um, they did the port of the original game for 3DS and they assisted Retro on the creation of Tropical Freeze for Wii U. Um, so yeah, that's what I know that guy from, or at least I know those games. Um, and another dev for this game was also working at Monster Games at the same time. And that was doo -doo 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 -doo, Josh DeFreeze, who was the, uh, he's, he's half of the, hold on, let me get this right. Uh, there's three artists credited on this game. He's one of them. And for both those Donkey Kong Country games, the latter day Donkey Kong Country games, he was working with Monster and is credited as an art design or art lead in both cases. One of one of two art leads, I should say. So yeah, pretty important over there at Monster. Um, but left to join Choice Provisions at some point along with... Oh, dang it. <laughs> along with uh, Ryan Glovka. So if you notice the, any similarities to the Donkey Kong games, <laughs> That might be why. Part of that same lineage. <laughs> in a way, in a very small way. A lot of the rare community like to say how much of um, a Donkey Kong Country style game Ukulele and the Impossible Lair was, and that's definitely a lot more. <laughs> in that, um, in that bloodline than this is. Virgil, then Arnold, and then we'll go check the zoo. Who else did I notice? So Alex Neuse, or Noise, uh, N-E-U-S-E. Um, he is the founder of Choice Provisions. He was previously working for Activision. I checked his history. He was the director on this game, by the way. The co-director. Um, I noticed some other games that I have connections to on his resume. Uh, he was the lead tester on Star Wars Episode One Racer for the Game Boy Color and for the 64. But I streamed the Game Boy Color version, so there you go, there's a connection for our stream. Um, uh, he was also a producer for Activision of Shamu's Deep Sea Adventures, which is an interesting game, like a SeaWorld branded game. Oh, I'm nuts. I need those tokens. Which, again, I've talked before about how problematic SeaWorld is, but... Um, oh, cool! I can hop like that, that's nice. Yeah. The GBA and DS version. Uh, Shamu's Deep Sea Adventure. Adventure or Adventures? I think it's Adventure. Yeah, the GBA and, D GBA and DS version, which I did actually stream briefly during my first Dolphin Games stream. They're one of the more Echo-like games that I've found in my searching. I would say 
most likely inspired by Echo in some way, for obvious reasons. Um, but certainly a lot more Echo-like than the console version of the same name. Yeah, and I had a pretty good time with that. I'd say the most Echo-like game I've played would be Flipper and Lopaka for Game Boy Color. <laughs> but yeah, I have quite good feelings about Shamu's Deep Sea Adventures. GBA and DS. Adventure. It's adventure, I'm sure of it. I can check my PS2 shelf. Hold on. Lean. Oh, where is it? No, it is adventures. There you go. It's right there on my spine. Sorry, the spine of the game box that I can see. To be clear. Oh, curses. Yeah, there's more names on the game credits for this, but none that I recognize from other works. But yeah, pretty talented people there. Actually, while I'm on the subject, I realize now that I missed International Women's Day because of my computer issues and then picking this game. When normally I like to do a stream around the time of International Women's Day to highlight the achievements of women in the video game industry and not just female characters, which some people and like corporate entities like to pay lip service to International Women's Day by highlighting female characters. But um, I think I will get to that, but it'll just be like delayed, so it'll won't, it won't be, uh, you know temporarily temp temporarily topical anymore but I will soon after this um, try and find some good games that are good examples of achievements of women in the video game industry from the development side and I have a few things in mind for that but if you have any suggestions feel free to suggest them as well Yeah, previously I've done like a mega stream of a bunch of different 80s home computer games, which is even more notable for women at the time when it was even harder for them in the industry uh, in the 80s. Alright, so we've unlocked some more levels by doing that bit of grinding, so yeah, let's keep going in the zoo. Let's go back to Wooly for a bit, because I find her levels a bit easier. <laughs> <clears throat> oh yeah, that's interesting. That is interesting. Okay, so I don't know if I'm gonna hold you to that right now. That's a we'll we'll pencil that in. But Gibbons suggested. Oh, hold on. We're seeing in the background now something not entirely unlike what was on the map screen, which I said was a rhinoceros dog hybrid. This is a different kind of dog head though. That wasn't that one is brown. This one's like a Dalmatian head. And the body looks odd, almost like a dinosaur. It kind of has the same build as a giraffe, because I remember that the front legs of giraffe are longer than the back legs. It could be an elephant, perhaps? Yeah, how strange. But there you go, there's some kind of, I'm going to say, elephant-dog hybrid there. Um, but yeah, Gibbon has an idea, and he's saying he's consume, currently consuming info about M36, a life planet for MSX, which at this point, given is considering an unofficial Metroid installment. Um, oh, there you go. The Little Agnes, and that's what it does look like on the map screen, the brown head. Interesting. Um, yes, so as he says, he would be interested to hear my thoughts about that on stream. And that sort of stars a female main character. If you take the idea that this is a Metroid continuation, and that's Samus. And yeah, I think I would be happy to try that out. So yeah, given what's asking in our chats earlier about um, MSX emulation, and I can only speak to my experience using FMSX on 
Mac, which doesn't really help uh, Mr. PC Windows over here, but um, <laughs> yeah, I hope you got that working and all good. I actually haven't really done much MSX animation at all until recently when I did Becky no Die Borken for the uh, arcade or 80s classic games clones where they swap out the main character for a female character. That's right, I never really found a better way to say that. I'm sure I did for the YouTube archive, but I don't remember what I said. So like heroin led. 80s clones or something. Yay! Oh, what was that other thing I recently I was watching a playthrough of some game that the ultimate enemy turned out to be someone called Mother Brain and I feel like just <coughs> forcing you to consider any any game with a mother brain in it to be a Metroid game, since I know you, uh, tongue in cheek, do say that about um, Blaster Master, where one of the early bosses is a mo is a character called Mother Brain. I love the smell of lasers in the morning. Oh, okay. There's an MSX call for Retro Arch, and Gibbon is trying to get it work working right now. But this is nice, we have a new background, an aquarium, and there's a shark crocodile hybrid. I know it's a crocodile because it has, uh, okay, so there's alligators, crocodiles, and gharials. Gharials have very narrow snouts. Um, what I learned about the difference between alligators and crocodiles, because sometimes it's hard to tell. Ooh, giant fly. Boom. Um, what I learned is that if you look at the mouth of an alligator, it has teeth that poke out onto the outside of its mouth, right? For an alligator, there will only be teeth coming out of the, either the top or bottom of the jaw, whereas with a crocodile, they'll do both. So you'll see uh, teeth poking out up and also down uh, over its uh, lips, for want of a better word, even the reptiles don't look out. <laughs> as well as crocodiles generally being larger and I think having snubbier snouts usually but um, that's the one surefire way to tell from what I understand maybe maybe wrong about that it's a rule of thumb perhaps <coughs> oh. let me throw it all dry You need me water. Let me do it with one hand. No nope, need to shoot this guy. Sweet. Oh. What was it? What was that game that had a mother brain in it? I'm pretty sure I saw it watching a YouTube video on the GDQ channel, which was highlights from the awful block of AGDQ 2019, or 2020, the most recent one. So I might review that. <clears throat> Flying is so much better than gliding. Too right, Wooly. But that's cool. Especially in the Meizu Torium where we're getting these weird hybrid animals, it's fun to have different things happening in the background. And this is kind of reminiscent of Donkey Kong, actually, now that I think of it. Tropical Freeze had a rocket barrel level where there were monstrous, uh, even uh, extinct sort of mega fishes in the background jumping around in the savannah world. There's a weird fish there. It's kind of like this, almost, isn't it? <laughs> and we have some development overlap there. 
I do wonder what the division of labor was on Tropical Freeze, how much Monster did, what they did, like whether they were doing specific parts of the game or just general art assets or something, I don't know. <clears throat> sure, I'm sure we'll never know. Ever, ever. I could have got these young balls if I really wanted to. I just didn't want to, okay? Given says that he thought they heard, that he thought that he heard that they were helping with level design. Well, I believe it. They did create all new levels. Um, <laughs> um, sorry, that's a, that phrase. Uh, uh, yeah, they made new levels for the 3D port of uh, returns for the bonus uh, world or whatever it is. Yeah. The cloud world, it had one extra level per world archetype. And those levels were good. They were great. They were fine. You know? They were perfectly prominent with the rest of the game's design. Whoa, what's this? Snails with little propeller hats that fly and then protect themselves with their shell. That's cute. <laughs> Fits in with the crabs, yeah. <clears throat> what are Monster Games up to now? I believe last I heard, the last thing that I know they were working on, and I hope I have got this right, is they were doing the completely unnecessary port of Xenoblade to the new 3DS. And it was exclusive to the new systems. One of the very few games that required a new 3DS. Oh, that's right. Yeah, they did a NASCAR game which we heard about in the Donkey Kong community because we were hoping, we were sort of pinning some of our hopes on Monster to continue the series after, um, because Retro can't do it forever. But no, the next thing we heard was they did a NASCAR game, a cross-platform NASCAR game. So they weren't even working with Nintendo on anything specific at that point. And that was pretty disappointing because Come on now, realistic racing sims are a dime a dozen. But Donkey Kong games, you don't get them out. <laughs> you don't get them that often, do you? Although you could equally say cartoony platform games, they're a dime a dozen. So I, I understand that that can be thrown back at me, so yes. Yeah, given says it's basically the only new 3DS exclusives. Um, yeah, there were some digital ones too, and of course SNES Virtual Console was exclusive to uh, new 3DS as well. But yeah, as far as retail games go. Alright, so we've run out of progress in the zoo, we're going to go back and grind on World 1 again. Exciting! Gibbons annoyed at Nintendo refusing to commit to the new 3DS. Yeah, say no. But hey, I was just playing my 3DS yesterday. Still getting some good use in this household. Tonya's dropped a link and saying this is depressing. MGI Racing. Oh, Monster Games website is, is now called MGI Racing. Or maybe it was always, because NASCAR is something that they've been doing since they, well, they were founded. Um, I think that's how they got into the Nintendo circle, because they did Excite Truck and then Excite Bots. Um, and then they did the, the Donkey Kong stuff and yeah, now they're back on NASCAR. Huh. They've done four NASCAR games <laughs> since Xenoblade. <laughs> Interesting. That's, that's okay. That's fine, I guess. Um, yeah, as Gibbon says, they've done yearly NASCAR games since. Oh, well. They also did Pilot Wings Resort, which is an interesting thing as a revival of the Pilot Wings brand. 
And I do like the connected Woohoo Island universe. That's kind of fun. <laughs> Whoops, wow, that was a nice little hop there. Fun stuff. Ah, oh, okay. Oh, are you kidding? How did I miss that? By the way, I do really like how these frogs or fish or whatever they are. Oh, it's fish later, but it's frogs here, I see. They have similar character designs, but yeah, different. Um, yeah, I guess these are frogs, and they're wearing feathers. It's very cute, just acknowledging that. <laughs> frogs and feathers. It's a good look. Gibbon says that um, I think he says the Pilot Wings Resort convinced him to get a 3DS. Oh, what? Um, yeah, he says watching his ex-wife play it made him run out to the store to buy his own copy of the handheld and game. Fun. <laughs> it's a good story. You know what convinced me to get a 3DS? Mega Man Legends 3. And I hadn't even played the first two. I've probably told this story before, but this was at a time when I was getting into uh, different um, gaming fandom communities on the internet. And one of my favorite games from childhood is Rockman Zero 2 and the rest of the series by extension. And I was looking up Mega Man stuff, and the Mega Man fan community has such passion for the Legends slash Dash games. And I got infected by it, and I was really excited um, by proxy, and I was also going to try out Legends through Legends 3, and, and through the playable prototype that was promised to be released digitally that would precede the full retail game. And neither of them ended up happening, even after I'd bought 3DS in anticipation. And I also bought it too late to take advantage of the Ambassador program, where they gave out a bunch of free digital games because they overcharged for the system initially. Or so they felt. So even though I bought it relatively early, it was just outside of that window. I think it was a after the first year, actually, that they dropped the price, so, you know, I had had time to buy a 3DS, but I still kind of felt excluded, um, because only this elite select few got the Ambassador games that they could play digitally on their fancy systems, and that always kind of irritated me. It's a, very much a double-edged blade, isn't it? To reward your loyal customers, but then your slightly less loyal customers get really shafted. <laughs> uh, am I being too entitled? Anyway. I felt bad for missing out. Much like what Gibbon was saying earlier about playing games in the window. Being plugged into a community and experiencing something at the same time as other people, so I suppose I get it. I get it. And yet here I am playing Pause on Fire long after everybody else stopped talking about it. I don't know why I didn't play this you know, on stream. I guess my experiences with streaming from PS4 are never as great as um, streaming from my computer. I'd have less control than I would like. Not to mention the microphone quality is worse. Much worse. But I'm not sure viewers mind too much about that, I don't know. Anyway, what was I saying? Stop. 3DS. So what's the first actual game I had on 3DS? I definitely played 
uh, White 2, to bring it back to that earlier conversation, I played White 2 on the 3DS, and there were special features that you would get by playing it on a 3DS, even though it was a DS game through and through. There was like, yeah, special stuff. And there was an accompanying app that was like face raiders, but with Pokemon. Because it was using a camera and pointing around and stuff, people kind of wanted it to be a Pokemon Snap successor, but it, people say that about a lot of things, and nothing is ever going to be a Pokemon Snap successor. I don't remember what that stupid app was called, but it was like, Pokemon appear in your living room, in AR, the, the augmented reality thing that the 3DS had. Um, and it was only select species, and then once you zapped them in that game, you then transferred them to your save file in Black and White 2. Um, but it was a very limited selection, <laughs> and I ended up with lots of duplicates of certain species. What's that dumb thing called? I just don't remember. I'm sure it had a really silly name. I'm having a ball, right? <laughs> well, I'm glad Arnold can find some humor. He's a real misery guts in the pilot, and for good reason. Bubsy is kind of mean to him unintentionally. Says there's so much good 3DS stuff that I'm sad they'll never, they'll probably never port elsewhere. Well, it's probably, yeah, it's impossible to port some of these things. But I don't know, that doesn't make me sad because I don't know, they exist on the 3DS and it's kind of a time capsule. I was never too concerned about things being ported later. Find out the name of this thing now because it's bothering me. So, Bulbapedia's page on the 3DS. List of Pokemon games. Uh, nope. Dream Radar. Pokemon Dream Radar. It had a new professor design, um, like I guess every spin off does these days. Oh yeah, that's actually a really good point. Among the stuff that's exclusive to 3DS is good digital-only stuff that is going to be impossible to play at some point, yeah. Eventually they're going to shut down the eShop and you'll never be able to play it again. You'll never be able to buy these things. You can't emulate the eShop. It's very sad. There's one... <laughs> There's one game that I, at one point, I'm going to borrow a Japanese 3DS of somebody, somehow add, oh, what's this? Gorilla Rabbit Hybrid. Wait a minute. This does not predate Mario plus Rabbit's Kingdom Battle. It postdates it. So, is this a reference to Rabbit Kong? There you go. There's another Donkey Kong connection for you. It's a half rabbit, half gorilla. It's Rabbit Kong in Bubsy. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, yeah, so at some point I'm going to borrow somebody's Japanese 3DS and buy on the eShop uh, Final Fantasy Picked Logica, which is a Picross game themed after Final Fantasy. There is a version of it on smartphone, but I think the version that is available for purchase on 3DS is a different kind of game because the one on smartphone is a really strange premium kind of thing where you just repeatedly do basic puzzles over and over again. Whereas I think the one that you can buy on 3DS in the Japanese eShop only is um, more of a traditional Picross experience, I think. 
And that's what I want to find out. And it looks cool. Also, it's got a bunch of cool new sprite art for a bunch of Final Fantasy characters from across the series. And it was actually a really good reference for drawing them. Um, just by looking up art from this game. Um, of all these different characters. So, yeah, it's cool. And, by the way, back there there was a purple gorilla with a rabbit head, and the sign said Keister Bunny. Now there's a stripy brown one. This is odd. We're getting unconventional gorilla colorations here. I gotta wonder if those empty cages that say closed for cleanup were going to have other animals in them and they ran out of budget. Maybe if the Kickstarter had succeeded, they would have been able to put extra animals in the background. <laughs> yeah, Skidden says, the Dylan games, Crimson Shroud, Box Boy titles, Pushmo titles. Yeah, I tried a Pushmo game, it didn't really grab me to be honest, but... Um, from the standpoint of basically being pro-game preservation, they should be available. Alright, so another Bubsy and Virgil and Arnold, that will get me at least one more level. We're close, we're so close to the boss I can smell. What's the time? 2.30. Cool, we've got time. We've got time. Gibbon says that he feels like the Kickstarter budget would have covered a couple artists, designers, and devs pay for another few months. Yeah, they were pretty upfront about what the additional um, budget would allow them to add to the game. So that's good. Oops. Huh. I don't know if I called it out before, but the houses that you see in the background, their roofs are made of yarn. It's a nice little sort of Yoshi's Woolly World-esque touch, I guess. I haven't obviously gone as far with it as that game did. No one's scanning if there's any other thing like it in the background, but the trees appear to be trees. first. <laughs> I meant to do that. By the way, I noticed I checked my list of trophies for this game and one of the ones that I got last week while streaming it was for um, hearing all of Bubsy's possible death lines in one sitting, uh, one play, like one play session. So there you go. I died enough times to hear all of the possible death quotes. Although, again, I couldn't actually hear them <laughs> myself, but they were played by the game somehow. backup plan for what to do if this game ran short because you know I cleared two worlds last time I had one more world to do in this uh, stream I didn't think it would take that long but I guess the token metal requirements are a bit higher for the final world so it is taking a while but I still kind of want to do the backup anyway so last week was a bit longer than nor the norm maybe I will and anyone complains, so be it. I would feel bad. <laughs> but I don't feel bad right now.
Yeah, there we go. The end of the level transitions into the next theme. That's actually something that, again, Donkey Kong Country Returns did pretty well. Um, the, the end of one world and the beginning of the next world sort of had some overlap in the theming of the levels. That was a really cool detail. The helmet hair is totally worth it. I, I, I'm sorry, but I know the Donkey Kong games better than the Bubsy games, so like I said before, I, I, I missed some Bubsy details. My memory did not serve me well in remembering Bubsy stuff necessarily, but I feel like I've internalized Donkey Kong stuff a lot more due to being in that community for such a long time. I do love Bubsy, I promise. I just don't remember if there were balloons in the original game, or that the pilot predated to the second game. Ow. I did notice Oblivia was here. I noticed that the very first time I launched the game, which was in the preparation time before last week's stream. <laughs> I don't think I actually called it out at the time on the stream. You gotta get better about landing on these boxes instead of jumping between them. You know, if Commander Video was in this game, it would have connected Bubsy strongly to the rest of the indie universe, which is ginormous, by the way. I already mentioned last week how he showed up along with a bonus minigame in um, Retro City Rampage, but he's one of the playable characters in Super Meat Boy as well, along with tons of other people. The next time I stream a so I, I did a couple of dolphin themed streams uh, last year, and one of my planned installments in that series is to do ad dolphin adjacent games, games with mermaids and like other kinds of sea creatures. And there's a lot of ground to cover there, but I did briefly cover Aquaria in one of those old streams. But Naja from Aquaria is in Super Meat Boy as well, and I think I have it unlocked now. She's a really interesting character in that game because she has a kind of aerial dash attack. Well, not attack, but a movement option. That can completely break the game if you can do it really well. I've, I've watched speedruns of Super Meat Boy where the guy is using Naja the whole time and just smashing open the level design and doing crazy things with the movement. Um, it's a really interesting watch. So go to speedruns.com, I think it is, and check out Naja Percent speedruns of Super Meat Boy. Pretty cool. Yeah. Oh, that's an excellent question. Thank you. Gibbon says, Milo, what indie studio would you want to reskin their formula as Bubsy next? Of course, following on from Black Forest Games taking the Gianna formula that they had done with recent um, games and then making a Bubsy game in the same sort of mold. This one is Choice Provisions taking their Runner series and doing a Bubsy take on that. What would I want from a Bubsy game? Okay, so it would have to be some company that does platformers. Hmm, let me see. Do we want another 2D platformer, or should we take, do another take on the 3D game? What's a 3D platformer that I really love? Well, I don't think Playtonic... <laughs> they're busy doing their ukulele stuff. Ukulele is great, but yeah. They're not going to do a Bugsy game, are they? Um, I like Spyro a lot, but who's doing Spyro games? Nobody. Is Activision going to come along and do a Bubsy game? I don't think so. Um, 
let me see, an indie studio. What are indie games I've played recently? Well, I played Crypto the Necrodancer recently. That would not make for a good Bubsy formula, I think. Um, I just play, I'm playing Toki Tori 2 right now, but I don't think that would be a good Bubsy either. Bubsy started out as kind of a take on Sonic's formula. Fast paced, really big levels where you go through them quickly. Um, so what, what is somebody doing Sonic games nowadays? Not Sega. Sega of course is doing them, but um, let's see. Who's doing Freedom Planet? What's their name? What about the Freedom Planet people doing a Bubsy game? Have they established enough? I feel like they're at a tier below Black Forest and choice provisions possibly. There's like tiers of developers of course, we know about AAA, AA. I would say they're maybe single A, whereas um, I would call the developers of Freedom Planet maybe a lowercase a. <laughs> sorry, is that, is that derogatory? I'm sorry. Um, Actually, Lilac from Freedom Planet is another one of those indie crossover things. She's shown up in a few different places too. Um, yeah, Tonya says Playtime. Yeah, that would be good. That would be very good, but I don't think they're going to do it. <laughs> is this Pie in the Sky Dreams of Dreams, or is this a bit more realistic? Let's see. Um, Gibbon says, I actually vote Gears for breakfast as long as they get rid of the problematic team members. Yeah, I would agree with that. And they might be on the right tier level. They might still be a little bit below. Actually, come to think of it. They, correct me if I'm wrong, they're the people who did a hat in time, right? Because I agree about the problematicness of certain team members involved, but they have shown that they were able to make a cromulent 3D platformer. So yeah, it, considering... Um, the Bubsy series, I would say we've had a couple of 2D platformers in the revival phase of the franchise now, so maybe a good 3D platformer take would be would be cool. And so I would say, let me see. Hmm. What other indie 3D platforms have I played recently? Knackbat64, that was cool. But that's just like one guy. <laughs> yeah, that's that's an even lower profile. What's below lowercase a? Um, I don't know. Can't think of a good joke. Oh well. All right, what are we missing? 72, 75. So we need 75 for the final boss, which is six more. I'll get one more from doing this level, which means that I need five more in other worlds. And I've pretty much cleared this one out now. I have. So now we're going here, I guess. Let's do it. <laughs> bit more grinding, just a little bit. Five more tokens. Yes, they are the Hat in Time people. Yeah. Um, they sort of retconned their own inspiration and said that they were suddenly uh, making a uh, Psychonauts homage, weren't they? So what if Double Fine did a Bubsy game in the vein of Psychonauts? I think, well, I don't know, part of the Psychonauts formula is the whole entering people's minds thing. I guess that could work with Bubsy, because part of his thing is going to different, like it's part of the whole movie star thing. Um, his, he has like a variety of different worlds that have outrageous theming to them, right? This has been the case in both 1 and 2. Not so much in 3D, and Fractured Fairy Tales did have something like that, but for different reasons. Um, 
Yeah, so that could work with like switching up genres and switching up visual styles and stuff. That would work for Bubsy. So yeah, is Double Fine too high profile? <laughs> I think it might be. Oh no, they got bought by Microsoft, didn't they? Uh, okay, I guess that's not on the cards anymore. Never mind. Yes, that's given points out. They are now Microsoft Studio. Oh, I become blue. says, if Gizbrook for Breakfast did a 3D take that brought back the visiting different fairy tales thing, that would be nice for changing genres and world gimmicks, like Hat in Time does as well. Okay, cool. So they've got that down pat as well. So yeah, that would be a good option. But if, but you also challenge me to one myself, so let me kick my brain to get every time you look at a list of games that I've played recently. played Snake Pass recently. That would not work for Bubsy. <laughs> um, oh, do, 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 do. I played Guacamole 2 recently. Drinkbox has a very striking visual art style, which could be made to work quite well for Bubsy. And they do brawler platform on metroidvania type things at least that's what guacamole is they also did severed which is a very different style of game let me see would a guacamole type thing be good for bubsy it might be but bubsy would become a bit more battle pose than if there was brawling involved but, you know, he's got big feet, he could kick stuff. And then you could have multiple playable characters as well. Which is something that Guacamole was really cool about. And Bubsy has a big extended cast, as we can see in this game. And you can include some of them as well. And it would be a Metroidvania, which is not something that Bubsy's ever done before. <laughs> hmm. It could work. But I don't know how Bubsy like it would feel if you did basically a guacamole clone. Mm, yeah. Oh, you know what else I've played recently? Some Konjak's game. Konjak's games. Joachim Sandberg. Iconoclasts and things like that. Would they make good Bubsy games? Probably not. He does make excellent games, but I don't know if it'd be a good fit. Um, way forward, going down that route, because Konjak is out of the way forward tradition. And WayForward are known for both making high quality original games and quite good quality uh, licensed games. So they definitely would not be above doing a, a, a Bubsy game, I think, WayForward, oh, if um, Tomo could afford them. But clearly this game is done reasonably cheaply because they wanted more money to make it a better game. 
so way forward might be good. And they've shown an aptitude with different kinds of games. But especially with 2D platformers. And it would look really great. One thing that Bubsy was always aspiring to be was, a, in a sense, a playable cartoon. Bubsy is a very cartoonish character with a lot of tropes from classic cartoons. And WayForward makes games that look like they're a living cartoon. Um, so yeah, that's actually not a bad option. I'm gonna say WayForward. There you go. That's my answer. And all I had to do was look at a list of games that I've played because my brain doesn't work. Oh, not another pop-up. Didn't I disable those? Oh, what's that? I got an achievement for pop-ups or something? By the way, I did want to point out one thing. Which is that, yeah, one of the bullet points for this game's features was unique character dialogue for every level. Although now I, I was sort of wondering about that, but I've just now realized that it probably means the pre-level quip that every character has before each level starts. So, yeah. I was wondering if they had like incidental dialogue or death quotes, but no, we went through all the death quotes, didn't we? No, we... Uh, yes. Ah! Uh, yeah, so it does indeed have incidental dialogue for every level per character. Yeah, I, I'm getting that feeling again that there is some syncopation of gameplay to music in this level. But I think it's just not executed on as well, generally, as it is in the runner games. Ah! You know what I would say? If I could choose who could do a new 3D Bubsy game, Arcane Kids, who did the James Turo retrospective, get them to do an official uh, version of that, an expansion on it. But let them have creative freedom for it, of course. Um, yeah. <laughs> so that's my answer. I agree with Gibbons' Gears for Breakfast answer, but my if it's a 3D game, get Arcane Kids to do it. If it's a 2D game, get WayForward to do it. What do you think of that? Ah, no, no, Arnold, my friend. All right, how many medals are we up to? It's the second time I've missed Virgil's third token. 73, I only need one more. All right, I guess I'll do Bubsy level because Bubsy is in the name of this game. And then we just need to do that one level in the bus. So let's do it. Yes, home stretch. I can feel it. I can feel it. It's coming. The end of the game. Oh. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's. Do it. And then I can speed run through the thing I was gonna do. Really went long. I promise.
I'm serious. Is that three or four times in a row that I've done the exact same thing? Get it together. Cool. Makes you go faster, doesn't it? Before, but that might be one of the reasons why it doesn't sync up to the sounds as much. Whereas, what any time I've noticed that happening, it's been Virgil levels where it does sync up, right? And those are the only ones where your pace is actually prescribed and constant, because Bubsy can pounce and go forward. Though, it seems like he does. Yeah, it, it definitely seems like he does. And of course, Wooly can go over the whole screen willy nilly. But Virgil's always going at the same pace, no matter what you do. Interesting. Forward making a Bubsy game would also be big news because Way Forward has a good reputation and it might have even more of a chance to be an actually good game. You know, unqualified good game. So I'd say Pause on Fire and Lily Strike Back are good enough, like they're, they're good, but qualified, you know, a little bit qualified. Ah, no. But going back to an early conversation, actually, I would want monster games to do what Bubsy does. All right, that's it. We're ready to go. We're ready to take on the penultimate level and then the boss. Let's do it, let's do it, let's do it. We're gonna finish this game. And then everyone can go home. Whoops, uh, this one, this one, this one. Uh, last chance for Wooly, let's do it because we're going to be Bubsy in the boss fight. Woo! What do you think of my choices, Gibbon? Way forward to do a 2D Bubsy game. And Arcane Kids to do a 3D game. That's right, we're going to see Oinko finally, aren't we? We see him couple of times in Mark 2, don't you? Again, I'm a bad fan because I don't remember. Given commenting on way forward. They're good. A sprite-based or drawn entry would be pretty neat. Been a while since we've had that. That's true. Because of course this is all 3D graphics, but what Way Forward excels at is excellent 2D animation, being it, be it sprite animation or drawn uh, vector. I like to call it vector. I don't know if that's really a correct term for what they do, but yeah, hand-drawn sort of animated style. They are very good at both, and I think that could be cool for Bubsy. And for either of those, my extra um, dream would be include as many fractured fairy tales elements as you can. That's right, I want to see that yellow exclamation mark. 
I want to see Arabian Nights. No, you don't have to just bring back all the themes, that's unnecessary. I want to see switches that you push somewhere in the level that open a gate. Yes, that's right. That is the thing that I want to come back from the Jaguar. Like a cat out of hell. Oh, I just had that, that visual thing. You know how when you watch the credits of a movie and then when they're over, it looks like everything's kind of falling because you're so used to seeing writing scrolling up the screen? I just had that because I'd been scrolling left the whole time. When I got to the end, the whole thing seemed like it was moving on the screen. It was a bit odd. Anyway, final boss. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I want to see collecting rubber balls instead of yarn. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Okay, pounce on Dawaka. There he is. Big pig guy on his mechanized tank thing. Oh, okay. Don't pounce the bullet. That's not the answer. Um, yeah, so he had a big kind of mech robot thingy in Bubsy 2, and this is continuing that, so yeah, it's all very referential, reverential, you might say. What's happening? Oh! Excuse me? Is that what I'm supposed to pounce? Otherwise, there's really literally no way to... Oh, okay. Yeah. Pouncing definitely makes Bubsy go faster, because this is how you catch up. I thought that was just telling me that's how you how you fight it when it comes time to do it, but no, it's telling me to do it in order to get closer to him, because that's how you... Oops! Okay, so you do have to be careful too. No, I tried bouncing on the bullets. Oh, I tried pouncing on the bullets, but not bouncing on them. No, the answer is pounce, pounce, pounce as much as you can, and that's how you catch up. But be careful about how you do it. Because you'll get hit if you're close enough. Okay, let's do it, let's do it, let's do it. Oh! I don't think that really should have killed me, just judging by how it looks, but um, I understand. I can get a bit of vertical, uh, horizontal um, distance there if I pounce, which kind of stalls me a bit, you know? Ah. But don't pounce until you're ready, because then you don't get a second pounce. <laughs> Tonya says, this boss sucks. <laughs> well, so far, I've decided to figure a few things out. There you go. Not too hard. There's always plenty of warning for the plow thing to come out. And otherwise you stay on the ground and you avoid the bullets. Yeah, that's not too bad. Oops! <laughs> Don't get greedy! What did you learn from Dark Souls? Although, to be frank, I like Bloodborne a lot better. <laughs> yep. Pop. That was risky. I almost hit that bullet. I think I should only pounce when on the ground because that gives me the most recovery time. I don't accidentally lose the ability to do so. And then I might hit a bullet too. So. And the best time to pounce is actually just before the plow comes out. Haha! <laughs> The draft helped me. Oh good, mid-boss checkpoints. Interesting. So we have a multi-phase boss fight with checkpoints. I like it. Oops. Cool. Yeah, this is good. This is going well. Nope. <laughs> Environmental interaction. Oh yeah, that's kind of the first time that's happened. The giraffe helped me. The background interacted with the gameplay. I do like Bobsy's glide.
I mean, if you've undershot something, whoops! If you've overshot something, you can just let go and you fall on it. <laughs> yeah, the giraffe toucan. It would have had a name on the sign. Ah, nuts. By the way, although I can hear the sound of the video game perfectly now, unlike last week, it still turned a little low for me to make out the words that they're saying per se, especially because I'm also talking myself. But you know, that's fine. Tonya said earlier that it was just annoying them, so mm -hmm. maybe it's better that I'm not catching every single thing. Also, we did cover it last week and I you asked earlier, Tonya, who voices Bubsy. Um, the theory is that it's Vic Mignogna who is uh, a controversial voice actor who has been accused of certain unsavory behaviors. bounce off things for more height, like this? Hmm, that doesn't even get you that much, you can double jump off them. You just gotta be really, yeah, conscientious about your height and your bouncing. I wonder if I'm supposed to be bouncing more in this phase too. It feels like I'm just supposed to get through the challenges that, that Blink is setting out for me there with the balloons, right? Am I supposed to also be... whoops? Huh, yeah. Do you get less glide drift if you're jumping off a pounce? Oh, whoa! Ah, what's happening? <laughs> that was strange. Okay. controller vibrating every time I'm done. Feels loud to me. Oh, no, 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 no. So, let me, let me test this out. Every time you bounce on a balloon, you get an extra jump and an extra pounce, right? Yeah, you do. So my philosophy is to jump off everything, get a glide going, and then if I need to, then do a pounce as a back off. I think this is further than I've been. <laughs> okay, there we go. Checkpoint, please. Okay, there it is. No! Oh! Oof. That was close. That would have been awful. <laughs> okay, cool. So now we're at this part. Great. You've been asking me if I should be pouncing forward. No, no. For that segment, you just need to get through it. Pouncing didn't seem to put me any further forward towards Oinka on the screen.
And yes, we are switching gameplay styles through the different phases. That's fun, isn't it? It's cool. Whoop. His death ray is charging. This is bad news. Oh! Oh well, we can have that checkpoint. Um, so what I just noticed about Oinka's character design is that he's wearing a ring on his left hand. Um, now, the thing about cartoon characters is they have three fingers, right, and a thumb? Sometimes, if they're, you know, in that style. Um, but what I'm thinking is, is that the equivalent of the ring finger, and does that imply that Oinka is married if he's got a ring on that finger because he's a cartoon character, so he doesn't exactly have a ring finger, but I think cartoon characters will just wear it on their middle finger, right? That's how the Simpsons do it. Anyway, there you go. Victory. And let's all speculate on what Oinka Peehan's spouse uh, is and looks like and who they are and what species they are. I think they're a tapir. All right, ending time. Let's do it. I think it's safe to say Oinker is going to be locked up for a long time. Serves him right, too. The food options here are downright terrible. On our planet, failure to serve churros in your concession stand is punishable by death. Wow. What did you say? Death? And operating a zoo without a license is punishable by community service? Well, <laughs> that's not so. And death. <laughs> another day, okay. another baddie behind bars. And I couldn't have done it without me. But to be a true hero requires <laughs> both grace and humility. And that's why I got you two a present. Please don't let it be another signed copy of his awful book. <laughs> oh, goody. A present? I hope you like it. This is your dry cleaning receipt. Pick up two dead by. If my sways are damaged, I'm holding you accountable. Okay. I'm taking the pokey. The animals are safe. And Bubsy has no idea what's going on. This feels like home. Yes, this is moi. Where? What? So it's my moi. Who? When? How? Well, I never. I'll be right there. Who wants it? I'm afraid that's on a need to know basis for you. Oh, come on. All I can tell you is troubles on the horizon. Sick I'm the only one who can stop it. You know what that means. It was a wrong number. We're all doomed. The rock wasn't available. <laughs> oh, they've got jokes. No, it means Bubsy will be back in. Wait, what? You said you were taking me fly fishing after this. <laughs> oh, I say a lot of things, Arnold. I say so, so many things. You do indeed. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Some funny jokes, some Bubsy flanderization as we expect from this revived series, and yeah, sequel hook, there you go. So there's the gauntlet, Arcane Kids, Gears for Breakfast, Way Forward, any one of you, pick it up, make an awesome Bubsy game for us. Thank you. Um, and yeah, Oinka P. Ham is going to be killed? Oh, no, no, they said on their planet the punishment is death, but this happened on our planet, so not necessarily the case that that's going to happen. Um, yeah, cool stuff. There you go, Billion Soft. That's the holding company that owns Bubsy now. And Tomo is affiliated with them somehow, I forget the details. So yeah, thanks Troy's provisions. A decent little Bubsy game. I'm just glad it exists, but I also had fun playing it. And I hope you had fun watching. Sit Bubsy, sit. What? Good cat. <laughs> Why is this so loud? Sit Bubsy, sit. Good cat. Uh, funny. Hilarious. Good joke. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry if that was loud. Um, we're a little bit over time, but hey, I'm going to go do my bonus thing that, I'm, that I mentioned earlier. Because I can, because I can. I can do that because I said I would and I'm going to.